or welcome all of you and thank all of you for attending today's forum. These forums are a great opportunity to raise our community's visibility and have really informative and impactful interactions with key state leaders, such as Dr. Steve Hine. We also want to thank South Central College for hosting today's event and offering up this wonderful venue. And then just a quick reminder that if you haven't registered already, there's still an opportunity to register for our next forum, which is June 1st, and the topic will be around recapping the legislative session that is taking place and will be finalized by Sunday at 11.59. So as you know, today's uh, event, the topic is the state of our workforce and the ability of our region to attract and retain a talented workforce has never been more important as greater Mankato employers and those throughout the entire state face a looming workforce shortage. Employers who are already facing difficulty in filling positions will see that challenge accelerate even further as the perfect storm emerges. And that's going to be due to an aging workforce, which we're all familiar with, a diminishing worker pool, and then you couple that with the anticipated growth of future employment opportunities due to a growing economy, it does create that perfect storm of which we're all going to be addressing, currently addressing, and addressing even more so in the next decade. So with the current aging of our local workforce, coupled with the projected job growth within our marketplace, we recently ran some data numbers, and we found that there's an estimate 2,800 new workers that our MSA, our marketplace, is going to need by the year 2020. That's not too far away. And if you look out even further to 2025, that 2,800 number actually doubles. So with talent fulfillment being a top priority for both Greater Mankato Growth and our entire community, Greater Mankato Growth has recently initiated um, a, new, a new initiative that we are spearheading that's called the Talent Fulfillment Initiative. And we've assembled a talent fulfillment steering team that is comprised of leaders from across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors um, who will undertake and establish a coordinated strategy, effort, and response to not only fill our current job vacancies, but help us address the growth of our regional economy and, and the new jobs that will be forthcoming. This steering team will begin their efforts and begin convening in June. And there's a number of you that are on the steering team who are here today, who are in the audience. So I just want to say thank you in advance for the leadership that you're going to be providing and serving on this important initiative for our community and region. So today's event is going to provide us a unique opportunity to hear from one of the state's top experts on the state of our workforce. Dr. Steve Hine will provide his perspective on the current demographic trends shaping our state and the impact that they will have on the labor force, as well as he'll be offering some data points regarding our particular region for, for Blue Earth and Nicollet counties. At the very end of Dr. Hine's remarks, we are going to open it up for Q&A, so please make sure to have your good questions ready. And if I can give you just a little bit more background on Dr. Hine. He has been with the Labor Market Information Office at the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development for over 18 years, and he has been the director of that office for the past 13 years. In this capacity, he and his staff of 30 are responsible for the production, analysis, and dissemination of the official employment and unemployment statistics for the state of Minnesota. And prior to joining the Dr. Hine taught economics at colleges and universities in New York, Washington, Arkansas, and Minnesota. So please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Steve Hine. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting me here on a nice sunny day. It was a beautiful drive down. Got to take a detour. Uh, before I start, let me. I, I, you know, I want to uh, sort of emphasize something Trudy just said about the perfect storm. I, uh, if I if I step away, can you still hear me? I tend to have a booming voice. My wife tells me. <laughs> uh, you know, th this issue of a labor shortage has been uh, 
a long time brewing. This perfect storm has been brewing uh, for a long time. You know, you think back over the course of the last 50 years of, uh, thank you, the, uh, the last century, we had the baby boom population, this big bulge of people that were born right after World War II, beginning in 1946, ending in 1964. That big bulge was entering their prime working years throughout the last uh, few decades of the century. At the same time, especially here in Minnesota, women were participating in our workforce at increasing rates. We had by far the highest female participation rate in the country by the end of, of the century. Uh, and all of that came to a screeching halt in 2001. <laughs> yes, simultaneously, that baby boom population started to turn 55. And I haven't figured out how, but a lot of people retire at 55. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we, we, we did start, and I'll show you some charts here that will illustrate this very clearly. We started to see uh, that big bulge in our population start to leave the workforce through retirement. And at the same time, our, our female participation rate had really reached levels where there was no further room for improvement. All right? Um, and, and so that happened simultaneously. So the last 15 years have really been dramatically different than anything we experienced for the 50 years before that. The only reason I think that we are only now started to really convene these kinds of conversations about what are we going to do in the future is that our economy experienced two recessions over the last 15 years, the second of which was a very deep and long-lasting uh, recession that really masked the fact that we had our labor force growing at much slower rates. Because there were all these unemployed people out there, it didn't matter how fast it was growing, there were, there were workers ready to take jobs. Um, but uh, as we'll see here, and I'll start this off with the first slide, maybe, there we go. Um, we've been experiencing pretty steady job growth for nearly seven years. The recovery will officially hit its seventh birthday in June, uh, next month, okay? And so here we have the U.S. in orange, the state uh, in blue, and the Mankato MSA in green. A lot more volatility the smaller areas you get, all right? But nonetheless, uh, throughout the seven years, we've been experiencing pretty steady 1% to 2% growth, all right? Not, not nearly as volatile or as overall strong as it was during the 1990s. But again, this is in light of a uh, demographic makeup of our population that has led to um, slower labor force growth. And as a result of this seven years of expansion, we've also been seeing that really huge number. I mean, we had a quarter million unemployed Minnesotans uh, in, two, in 2010, okay? That number's down around 110, 115,000 now, so, so less than half. And, and you can see, if we look at the blue line, the state, but also the green line, which is Mankato, all right, those are down to levels where we really don't have a lot of additional room to grow by tapping into what was once a very large pool of available workers, all right? Um, Mankato's unemployment rate just recently ticked up again, but was below 3%, okay? Uh, that's, that's what we would think of as being full employment, to say the least, all right? Even the national rate of 5% uh, is deemed by many economists to be uh, at full employment. And here in Minnesota, we're at 3.8. Um, there's not a lot of room to grow, and that's reflected in part by that flattening out. We haven't seen uh, much of an improvement or a further decline in our unemployment rate because there isn't much further room for that to fall. We did hit 2.5% in the late, <coughs> excuse me, 
late 1990s, but um, that didn't last long. Okay, so that's kind of the backdrop here, you know, historic context, how we got to where we are today. Um, I do want to look a little more at this issue of, of our labor force. This is a chart that shows the statewide annual increase in our labor force going back to 1977, 76, when we started collecting the data. Okay, uh, it was the first year we had state level labor force numbers. And, and you can see what, I, what I'm talking about with the, with the baby boomers hitting prime working years and women increasingly entering the labor force. Until 2001, we averaged over that 25 years 40,000 additional workers per year. Some years we topped 70,000, 60,000, okay? But 40,000 additional workers every year for 25 years. Since then, our average gain has been 13,000, okay? So one third as fast over the last 15 years as it was the 25 years before that. You can see that 2001 uh, decline. And here, here's what has happened in, in uh, this is actually South Central Minnesota. <laughs> I forgot to put South in there. This is the nine county South Central region here. All right. Uh, we started collecting data at the regional level in 1990. So we don't go back as far, but nonetheless, over that 10-year or 10-year uh, period, the region added about 1,430 workers per year on average. Since then, 180 per year. So one eighth is fast. And and you can see that in the majority of the years, five, six, five, seven. Hey, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Out of the 13 years there we actually saw a decline in the number of people here in South Central Minnesota that were in the labor force. Take this moment to check my notes to see what I've forgotten to say. <laughs> um, no, I, I, did, I did note here too that while this is um, South Central, the nine county South Central region, uh, looking at the Mankato MSA, that is Blue Earth and Nicollet counties alone, uh, the labor force gains fell from 660 over this 10-year period to 450 over, over uh, the more recent time period. So the Mankato, the, the two counties here in the center of the region, have uh, fared much better than uh, the rest of the region. Now, about the future, here's, here's a chart that shows what is currently the official workforce uh, projection that is produced by uh, the state demographer's office, okay? Uh, what I've done here is I've broken this up into growth or change between the labor force that is 16 to 64 and the workforce that is 65 and older. And in five-year increments here, over the next five years, for example, uh, the demographer's office projects that we'll be adding 4,130 workers per year. But as you can see from that yellow bar, all of that growth and then some is among the older cohort, the 65 and above, all right? 16 to 64 year olds, in fact, are projected to decline by about 3,000 a year over the next five years and 4,500 or so over the five years after that before finally starting to turn around, okay? So <clears throat> this is the official projection. That it calls for a cumulative increase in our statewide labor force between now and 2030, 15 or now 14 years from now, of 62,275, which is less than we saw in a number of years <laughs> in one year, okay? Back in the 
80s and 90s. Now we were, we were talking beforehand uh, about these projections and uh, as mentioning that we, we've had a lot of conversations around this topic because of its importance and uh, I, I, I gotta say that I believe that these are actually pretty optimistic uh, pretty optimistic scenario especially in terms of the growth that is projected among the older age cohort here. Basically this assumes if these numbers are going to pan out that a much larger share of us that are hitting 65 over the next 10, 10 or 15 years are going to stay in the workforce a lot longer than 65. All right. So I just did a simple kind of uh, little exercise. What if, what happens to our labor force growth if across all the age cohorts the participation rate, the share of each age cohort that is in the workforce stays constant at current levels. And in that case, what we find is a cumulative increase in our workforce of only 9,500. And all of that's coming in the last five years, between 2025 and 2030. Between now and 2025, statewide, we're going to lose workers overall. Okay, and the, the smaller gains in the old age cohort, in other words, are not going to be offset, are not going to be enough to offset the large declines in the 16 to 64 year olds. Okay, so a cumulative increase over 15 years <coughs> of only 9,500. Uh, I don't have a slide to show this, but uh, we do have a, uh, a, a labor force projection in a publication online uh, called, a, uh, it's a regional profile for each region in the state and um, applying this same kind of methodology to the, the region, um, again this is a, under the optimistic scenario based on the state demographers uh, methodology. Um, the region is projected to lose about 300 individuals over the next 10 years. And I think if my quick calculation at, at, at our, our meeting beforehand is, is at all accurate, under a less optimistic scenario that could easily be a decline of about 2,000 individuals over the next 10 years in the region. <coughs> now, some good news, <laughs> at least for, for Blue Earth County. Uh, we, we can also break out the age distribution of the workforce by county. Uh, and I've done this for each of the counties. And, and in this chart, I show the counties that are those that have at least 30 percent of their workforce being older than 55. So for example, uh, you know, some of these, uh, a third of the workforce we can expect to retire in the next 10 or 15 years, okay? The, the counties with the lowest share of workers older than 55 includes Blue Earth, okay? Uh, less than 20 percent of the workforce here in Blue Earth County are in that near retirement age cohort. Um, this map shows you the median age by county, but also uh, I wanted to use this because in fact Blue Earth County has the lowest median age of any county in the state. This is good news for this county, all right? And the reason for it becomes uh, clear too when you note that there are these occasional other blue counties amongst the sea of red and what they all have in common is they got a college campus. All right? Crookston, Bemidji, Moorhead, Morris, uh, Southwest, and so on. So the college campuses here, okay, have given this county anyways an opportunity, you know, to, to sort of push back on this this what gray tsunami, whatever we call it, uh, 
all of us old people leaving. Um, I, I've, I've used this chart more as a way of emphasizing how uh, significant this is for rural Minnesota. All right, you see all the red. You see all, uh, all of these counties, I think with the exception of, of Aiken County, are along the western border of the state. Um, but the map also illustrates the, the, the advantage that, uh, that Blue Earth County has in this respect as well. All right, now <coughs> another important demographic change that we're going to be experiencing here is an increasing diversity in our population. All of us Scandinavian old white people, <laughs> all right, are going to, you know, leave the workforce in incre at increasing rates over the next 15 years. And the individuals that are coming in and taking our place are increasingly uh, people of racial or ethnic minority. Um, our white alone population is projected to grow by 4.1% over the next five year, 15 years, rather. All of that and more is in the 65 and older cohort, okay? <coughs> While minority populations are projected to grow nearly 10 times faster. This is statewide. Nearly 10 times faster than the white population. And if we could do this by workforce, and, and, and the demographer's office and we are, are trying to work on this, uh, what we would see is that our white workforce is going to shrink. Okay? And all of the growth that we will see is going to come from the minority population. Here's a, here's a, a one year example of the trend that's yet to come. This is American Community Survey data comparing 2013 to 2014 statewide. And what I've done is I've looked at the population and the, and the labor force uh, numbers for white and black populations. All right? And what you can see is that in that one year, our white population increased by 10,000. 20,000 of them were 65 and older. All right? All the other age cohorts lost population. Whereas our black population increased by more, with only a small fraction of that increase being in that older population. Mo you know, most of it was in the prime working age population. And you can see that in the, in the labor force numbers. Our white labor force dropped by nearly 2,000, while our black labor force increased by 9,500. Okay, this is just one year, and things are going to get worse before they get better, all right? But this, I think, shows you very clearly the kinds of changes that we're going to see year in and year out for the next 15 years. Another aspect of this, using the same data, is looking at the um, uh, population change and labor force change between U.S. born and foreign born individuals in our state. All right? Our U.S. born population increased by nearly 8,500, while our foreign born population increased in one year by 33,000. All right? And again, all right, this was a lot of old people, and, and, and 5,800, in fact, 5,800 U.S. born individuals left the labor force, or the net decline was 5,800, while nearly 30,000 of the increase in the labor force that we saw in one year. That was all of our labor force growth, all right? All of our labor force growth in one year can be attributed to foreign-born uh, workers. All right. The other uh, um, point I want to make, too, is that not only are these shifting demographics going to impact our labor force, but they're also going to impact the kinds of jobs that are going to be growing out there. This is a ranking of the industries in our state 
that we project to add the most jobs over, over that 10 year period. All right? And if you, if you just look down that list, first, first of all, you see four out of the top five, other than general merchandise stores, are, are associated with healthcare. Okay? And, and much of that is the healthcare of an aging population. I know I had something to say about this. Okay. Yeah, four out of the top five, eight, eight of the top 14 industries are related to healthcare and or some sort of social services for an aging population. <clears throat> um, if we look at, this is, this is by industry. Okay, so the number of workers that were expected to add to continuing care retirement communities, for example, regardless of whether they're caregivers or accountants or, or managers. But if we look at occupations, all right, within the professional and related occupations, again looking at a, a 10 year projected growth rate, healthcare practitioners, followed by community and social service occupations, are the two fastest growing um, professional subgroup in our occupational projections. Uh, back in, you know, 15 years ago, computer jobs, IT jobs were projected to grow more rapidly than any other. And they're still third, but still, uh, you can see the impact here across the occupations that this aging population is going to have on the job mix that we're going to have to be filling over the next 15 years, at least over the, the next 10 years. Uh, in the service occupations, we see the same thing. <coughs> healthcare support. The, the biggest driver in the healthcare support area is home health aides. Those are projected to grow a lot. <laughs> All right, and, and in the personal care, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that is driven largely by personal care aides. Home health aides and personal care aides uh, are the kinds of occupations you can see in the service uh, uh, grouping of occupations that we are expecting to grow most rapidly. So just some uh, closing Comments. What are, so what does this all mean? Uh, <coughs> so to, to reiterate, the, the shortage, a shortage of workers is going to be the norm. Now, we're not going to try to pretend to project here when the next recession is going to occur, what's going to precipitate it, what what's its impact is going to be on, on different sectors of our economy or different regions of the state. Um, these projections are not so much meant to be sort of what's employment going to look like over the course of the next 10 years, but what will the structure of the economy look like in terms of changes across industries and occupations, assuming that we move <coughs> from full employment now to full employment then. Um, but <coughs> clearly we're going to have a shortage of workers. And, Unless, I guess, we um, have a recession like 2008, which I don't see happening. Um, but I think we can also reasonably expect us to have a recession at some point. Like I say, we're seven years into the recovery now. That's uh, about, uh, 14, about two years longer than the average post-war recovery in the United States. So we're doing well, all right? We've had a steady and sustained recovery in jobs, and we may well have another recession, but we're not trying to guess that. Um, noted that increases in health care, personal care jobs, that's going to be where a lot of these, these new jobs are, are going to be found. But we also project construction and, and IT jobs. Those are going to continue to grow. Uh, uh, quite strongly as well. Um, job growth, though, is going to be constrained by 
the lack of warm bodies to fill jobs. We don't count a job until there's a person to fill it, okay? I mean, we, our, our, these job counts take into account the fact that we know we're not going to be adding workers at, to the tune of 60,000 a year, all right? But rather, uh, you know, maybe 60,000 over the next 15 years. So, so we, we do constrain these job growth numbers to align with what we expect or what the demographer expects to happen to our labor force numbers over time. Um, <clears throat> but having said that, a lot is going to depend on what actions are taken by regions within the state, you know, to try to, to tilt the balance. All right. What are we going to see happening in terms of immigration? You might be aware that there's a there's a presidential campaign, all right, uh, being waged right now, and one of the hot issues is how do we deal with immigration? What kind of immigration reform do we need? Uh, not to get political, I do not get political in these, but immigration we have seen how. how important immigration has been very recently to our ability to fill the jobs that employers are, are needing to fill, okay? So immigration is, is an important part of any strategy to uh, sustain a, a region or a state's growth rate. Um, <coughs> but beyond that, we also have to be sure that we take into account any barriers that exist among the existing workforce, all right, and, and remove those barriers so that the warm bodies that we do have can avail themselves of the opportunities that, that employers are offering them. And, and here's just a, probably an incomplete list, but are people coming out with the right skills? Is higher education and public education, 12, K-12 education, preparing and aligning the workforce of the future with the needs of the employers in the community. We often hear that transportation is, is an issue, especially with a lot of the low income individuals that are you know, one flat tire away from missing a day at work and, and getting canned for it. Uh, Childcare, any, you know, anybody that's had to pay child care over the last couple of years knows that uh, college tuition pales in comparison to child care in, in many instances, you know. Is, is affordable child care available? A uh, lot of discussion both state level and, and in places like Minneapolis about the availability of sick leave or, or paid leave for personal reasons. Uh, again, a lot of employees, workers, uh, that are one paycheck away from, you know, the, the poor house miss a day because they're sick or their child is sick and, and uh, it can set back their, their employment status and, and, and low wages. I mean, I've got to gotta think that, you know, wages matter when it comes to luring people that may otherwise not be in the workforce back into the workforce. Uh, okay. Uh, we also need to see improved worker mobility. Uh, and, and this is something, <coughs> a region like this, with a lot to offer, on the one hand has a, you know, a young population here uh, with education and skills looking to start their career. You know, what do you do to make sure that a good share of them you know, are aware of the opportunities that, that the Mankato area has to offer, uh, but also, you know, what can be done here to attract people from other regions and other states. Um, the, house, the, um, the recession had a really negative impact on our ability to recover in no small part because of what's called housing lock. People's, you know, they were underwater with their mortgage all right, they lost their job, they couldn't pay their mortgage, they're, they're, um, they're in foreclosure, and yet they can't, sell, they can't sell their house and move to where the job opportunities are, okay? Because they get less for it than they owe on the mortgage. So improved housing market conditions have been a real boon, but we're not out of the woods yet, 
especially at the low end of the, of the housing market where some of the hardship is, is most acute. Um, portable health care, we all know about the importance of <laughs> portable health care and, and, and policy. Whatever happens with Obamacare, uh, I think we need to recognize that pre-existing conditions and the ability to take your health care with you as you move jobs or, or, or move location is, is important for being able to take advantage, full advantage of the workforce that we're going to have available to us. Um, and I, th this is one of my pet projects or peeves or <laughs> uh, is, is labor exchange systems. Um, the use of online job boards, okay, for matching job seekers and, and employers. I, I think we need to, I don't know, take a good look at how we're going about matching individuals who put an electronic resume on some job board that gets matched to some job posting based on a keyword algorithm. Um, I've, I've learned that the, one, the first question I have to ask somebody that whose resume I get when I have an opening is, do you know you applied for this job and are you interested in it if you, if you did? I, you know, it, and, and oftentimes, no, I didn't, no, I don't. I don't want to work for you, <laughs> all right? But, uh, you know, the matching algorithms, too. I, I had a staffer uh, that had no IT background whatsoever, got, uh, got called in for an interview as a, as a computer programmer. And he wondered, how, how did I get this? And well, he worked at one point for Scandinavian Airlines System, and he abbreviated SAS, SAS. And the, I, the programmer position was looking for somebody with SAS skills. And so that was a match. I, I don't know. I don't know. Some of these things just don't seem to do what we hope. Uh, I think, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's a big part of the, the problem, big part of the solution down the road. With that, I will turn it off and open it up for questions. Yes? How does automation fit into this whole picture? Yeah. Uh, as a hotly debated issue, uh, you know, are we, are we moving into uh, a time where automation is going to uh, um, replace workers? I, I think the, the bulk of the evidence is that automation um, is complementary to high-skilled individuals, but substitutes for low-skilled individuals. So, so a, you know, a, a robotic device may replace a, a factory line worker, but will require a programmer in, instead, okay? Um, I, I know there, there are, uh, there, there's been, very recently, a, a heated exchange back and forth among economists about, you know, the extent to which robotics may be uh, uh, replacing workers. Um, I, I think that the coming conditions and the shortage of workers is going to promote the development of robotics as a, as a, uh, as a, a uh, as a input into the productive process, yeah. What, what's your view or what, do uh, you have numbers you reflect as far as talk about people who have just dropped out of the workforce? I don't know all the parameters and the... Actually, I, I just wrote a piece that's in our Minnesota Trends Quarterly. <laughs> I, you know, and, and I did this, I did this because I sensed that there was this uh, um, perception that people that have dropped out of the labor force are just laying on the couch, you know, <laughs> waiting for something to happen. Um, what, what I found in just a very scratching of the surface of the, of the data is that, of course, the, the biggest reason for the increasing pool of workforce dropouts is that they hit 65 or 66, you know, that we have a growing share about half of our non-participants 
in our workforce are 65 or older, okay? Now, I also found that there was a, a good share of the remaining 50% that had college degrees, oftentimes bachelor's or advanced degrees. They were also very disproportionately women, young women, okay? Um, so, you know, I, I got to think that there is a, 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 a decision, a voluntary choice that individuals are often making to leave the workforce for family-related reasons. So should there be some uh, opportunity, a more flexible, some uh, strategy to re-engage those people? Right, right. I mean, our, 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 and I don't want this to be, you know, we can talk about stay-at-home dads too, but, you know, our parents, often single parents, having to stay home because they can't afford the childcare. That if there were childcare resources available, you know, they'd be gladly back at work, but, you know, it doesn't make sense to, to pay $20 an hour for childcare when you're making 15 bucks an hour on your job. So, um, uh, but, it, you know, the bottom line is that there was just a very, a relatively small fraction of individuals that are not in the labor force um, because, because they don't have the education, which, which certainly is often the case, um, that there, there, there may be other barriers that this very simple demographic slicing that I looked at uh, can explain. Uh, we do have very high unemployment rates for our racial minorities. We have the worst gap in the nation. We have had for years and years and years. Um, so it's not surprising that there may be a good share of our non-participants out there that are, you know, discouraged. But most of our uh, non-participants uh, are non-participants voluntarily, either because they've retired or because it looks like they have other family obligations or, or other. Maybe they're just very well off and don't need to work. <laughs> there must be people like that out there. You had a slide about the growing occupations for professional and service. How about manufacturing and egg? Yeah. Um, manufacturing is going to lose jobs. That's, that's the projection. We've been losing manufacturing jobs since the mid-1990s. A lot of it has to do with, with uh, the um, capital labor mix in manufacturing. Uh, we do not have the assembly lines, the labor-intensive production processes in manufacturing that we, we used to have. Um, manufacturing's been doing very well measured in terms of output and, in many cases, profits. They're just not the place to go get a job. I think one of the challenges that manufacturers are going to have, and I, and I know that's a very important industry for this region, is that, um, you know, when you're, when you're kind of career guided here to choose an area that you want to go into, you want to look for areas that seem to be growing. And if you look at manufacturing, you know, from somebody that's wanting to start a career, manufacturing does not look very attractive, right? Um, I've heard people say that, you know, there's still the reputation of it being a, you know, a, a physically demanding and dirty job. I, I, I don't know how much of that there is, but if you just look at the numbers and read the stories about manufacturing, hey, it's, it's great if you're, uh, you know, a an owner, <laughs> it might not be as appealing to an individual that's looking to start a career. And so how do you make that sales pitch, you know, to individuals that are looking to go into a particular line of work when what they're going to be looking at is what has happened to the number of jobs in this sector over the last 10 or 20 years. So it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough sell. Yeah. The second part of the question was focus on agriculture. Yeah. I, gosh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. We don't, we don't, we actually don't collect a lot of data on, on ag employment directly. 
Um, much of our data is collected on the basis of employers that are uh, subject to unemployment insurance laws and um, uh, farms are not. How about non-farm? But, but they're, you know, I mean, we do have, whenever I, I drive down here, I'm just uh, amazed, especially at this time of year, at the so soil. Anybody ever driven down south and driven through farm uh, territory down south, it's all red clay? <laughs> you know, you think, how can anything grow in that? And you look out here and, geez, it just looks, you know, so promising, right? Uh, I mean, ag, ag, you know, and, and companies like um, Cargill are, are obviously very important to our economy. Uh, as a source of jobs, again, I mean, you know, manufacturing's been going through some of the same sort of evolutionary process that agriculture went through a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, mechanization of the production process, the replacement of farm hands and, and factory line workers with, with machines. So there again, you know, when, when we're talking about employment, um, that, that looks like a hard sell to me to make. As a, as a place that you ought to go into. Um, so is that inclusive of like food production manufacturing? Because I'm wondering if it's getting split out and so you can have a good data on it. Yeah, well we do, we do report on food manufacturing. Um, you know, that's certainly an important part of our economy, especially down here and, and further west. And, at East. Uh, I just wondered if it's separated out in a and or manufacturing and it's not any one of the right sectors. Uh, ag related businesses are all over the industrial map. Um, obviously they're in manufacturing, not only in food manufacturing, but in implement manufacturing, uh, machinery manufacturing. Um, we, we have, of course, big corporate headquarters that are involved in agriculture and, and food that will appear in a, in a corporate headquarters industry breakout. Um, so it is hard, and again, we were talking about, you know, the data as we compile it doesn't necessarily tell you that picture. You'd want to look at like an, an implant impact analysis kind of approach that takes into account the supply chain networks that exist within and across industries uh, to get a better picture on what the significance is of agriculture. Um, and all I'm saying is that as far as uh, the job growth in the future, yeah, we look to be moving into a healthcare social service uh, kind of economy and to a great extent that is the case by headcount of job holders. That's not to say that manufacturing and, and agriculture is not going to continue to be very significant parts of our economy. It's just that they're both various phases of this process moving towards a more cap capital intensive rather than labor intensive um, orientation. I don't want to be mindful of the time here. Yes? Does our state data differ much from the national data, or are there some unique differences here in our state or region? Uh, we have, we, of course, we're a highly educated workforce. We are. Um, we have uh, one of the highest rates of high school graduation. We're top five and we're like top 10 or 12 in, in the share of our workforce that has a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, our occupational mix reflects that. We are much more concentrated in the uh, professional uh, types of occupations like IT and finance and, um, and, and, and of course less concentrated in, in some of the lower skilled service sectors that I don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg, you know? Do we have a high uh, concentration of these occupations because we got the workforce or do we have the workforce because that's what our occupational mix is? But um, 
you know, that, that's been, been well known to be the case for, for some time. And then, of course, by, by industries, we have some significant comparative advantage, advantages in some of the manufacturing areas. Um, and, and, you know, it's not manufacturing areas necessarily that are, that are going to be experiencing the same kinds of challenges that, you know, say a Detroit did um, 20 or 30 years ago. You know, but biomed manufacturing and, and agricultural manufacturing. Is there a workforce shortage predicted nationally? Yes. Yes. Um, we've always also had a very low unemployment rate relative to the nation. You saw that in the chart. We're, we're on average over the last 35 years about one and a half percentage points below the nation. Um, our participation rate is one of the highest. In fact, last month it was the highest. Although I think North Dakota has dropped off just because of the, the oil-related, energy-related challenges that they're facing right now. Um, so we don't, ha we don't have any uh, cushion like a lot of other parts of the country do. We don't have a, a large pool of unemployed individuals out there knocking on doors. And we, although we might be able to tap into some of these non-participants, we don't have as much of an opportunity to fill the, the job gap in the, in the future with, with higher participation. So I think in that, to that extent, we've already started to see, um, uh, go all the way back to the, um, we were, uh, we came out of the recession faster <laughs> than the nation. Looking at the blue line, Mankato even more so, okay? We held steady with the nation for quite a while, but lately we've, the blue line's persistently below that yellow line. I, I think that's in no small part because we've kind of hit the ceiling earlier than the nation has because we're at 3.8% and the nation's at 5% unemployment, and because our participation rate's at 72% and the national rate's only 65. So I think we're gonna start to see the impact of the next 15 years hitting us earlier and perhaps harder than, than many other parts of the nation. I think we have time for just one more question. Yeah. I ask you to shift gears here and, and uh, what advice would you have for a high school junior, going to be a senior next year, that's got a GPA of 2.0 and isn't really focused on school or focused on the future? What would yeah. you, what yeah. advice would you have for a person? That, yeah, yeah I, you know, I think there's going to be a, a, a wealth of opportunities sort of across the spectrum. Um, we hear a lot about the, 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 the growing opportunities in the trades. Construction has, has been our strongest uh, industry in terms of job growth coming out of the recession. Of course, it was the hardest hit during the recession. <laughs> and, and part of the challenges, now I don't know, you know, part of the challenges that construction is having is that they tend to only hire young white men. And what I've just said is that we are old, diverse, <laughs> uh, you know, workforce. That we, we do not have a demographic makeup that is particularly uh, convenient to construction firms right now or, and will not have in the future. Um, furthermore, the recession that hit construction caused a lot of those construction workers to go elsewhere. All right, so they've left. They're not, they're not sitting there five years later waiting to be called back. So construction companies have a real hard time, um, and yet you know they're going to they're projected to grow after healthcare, the second fastest sector over the next ten years. Um, you know, and there's there's I often bemoan the fact that I went into economics and not <laughs> not something where I could work outside with my hands. But uh, you know, but there are there are other areas that I think are going to um, provide good opportunities for uh, kids that don't necessarily need to go get a college degree. Uh, again, we were talking earlier, you know, it seems like every, every so often you hear the case made that, well, college graduates earn so much more than high school graduates, therefore everybody should get a college degree. It's like, 
you know, if I leave the football game at the end of the third quarter, I beat the traffic. Does that mean everybody should leave the football game at the end of the third quarter and beat the traffic? No, you know, it's a fallacy of composition kind of thing. There are a lot of opportunities. A lot of the job growth we're going to see are in areas that are not going to require a college degree that can be quite lucrative with, with significantly less. Um, I, I invite you all to go onto our website. There's a lot of different data tools there. One of them is called the Graduate Employment Outcomes. And you can now look at the uh, employment outcomes of graduates from Mankato State. I keep calling it Mankato State. Is that okay? Yeah. I went to Bemidji State. It's always Mankato State. Um, uh, and you can see where they ended up and, and at what wages. Uh, you know, I think this will help somebody in that situation look at what the likely outcomes are if I go into a short-term certificate program rather than a four-year degree or a two-year degree rather than a, a graduate degree or whatever. You know, we got it all broken out there um, by, by award level, by instructional program, by, by institution. And uh, you, can, you can get a good sense, I think, as to what, you know, at least the, the previous graduates have been experiencing coming out of those programs. Well, if you could all help me thank Dr. Heinz. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.